Hey, what's up, everyone? So, welcome to Chapter 2, and I'm actually re-recording Chapter 2 because, for some reason, uh, it didn't, uh, the recording audio didn't do what it was supposed to do, so I am redoing this. Um, so, let's talk about this. This is basically dealing with the founding of our country, and it's sort of interesting to note that the country was founded in an unintentional way because... Uh, in fact, if I were titling this chapter, I would probably title it Unintended Consequences. And I mean that because basically the, the country happened as a byproduct of King George foolishly thinking that the colonists were all like, yay England, poor us. And, uh, uh, and that's what really got him in trouble uh, to begin with was his failure to understand the separation between the colonies and England. Uh, particularly because you think about from the time that we, the first landing uh, of a ship, uh, the Mayflower, right, in 150 years or so earlier, the the idea of how many generations of people you know, that had gone before is significant because people were living 30, maybe if you're lucky, 40 years on average. So you're probably talking four or five, maybe six generations from the time of the first colonists that came to the to now the mid 1700s and so their idea of understanding of england is like nothing you know i mean it's like it's not like today where you can get to england and you know flying from san diego in 10 and a half hours or cross the atlantic in a matter of you know a, of a day or so and now it's like if you think about it it's you know took months to get from new york to, to england if you were traveling by boat so their understanding and disconnection was was evident even before this time, but it had certainly come to uh, fruition and had come to its pinnacle at this point. So a couple of things happened, um, and, and as I get into this, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and do it relatively quick, but I want to make sure you understand the context of how we got where we are. So basically, the colonies were basically governed by England uh, for the first 150, 60 years. And the structure was there was a royal governor who was kind of like the president of the colonies, if you would. Uh, and then the governor had a council of elites, which is usually a, a, some representatives from each of the 13 colonies. And then there was a general assembly, which were, again, a wider range of, of the wealthier or more elites uh, of the colonies. And this is basically the structure of the politically of the country from its inception up until the mid 1700s. Now, uh, the, what takes place after this is really what is quite interesting. If I can get this to move forward, which I can. So, in 1754, the French Indian War occurs. Now, this is really a war between England and France. Uh, not so much a war between the, in, the, the Indians and, and the French. In fact, the Indians and French were basically allies against England uh, in this war that lasted about nine years, that would be culminating with the Treaty of Paris in 1763. Now, which most of you may not know, but it's definitely always the case, even it's going from this point, even going forward, is that wars cost money. And so, there was a lot of debt. Uh, Brit, the Brits were certainly spent up a lot of money in this war, and so King George is a problem. He's he's low on cash, and he's trying to figure out how he's going to put money back in the royal bank, in his royal bank. <laughs> so he comes up with this idea: I'm going to tax the colonists, <laughs> and it sounds like a great idea, right? But there's a problem: <laughs> you're taxing them, but they don't really have any representation. So they're like, "Whoa, whoa, wait a minute." You're trying to get money out of us. We don't really have anything. We're barely make, make scraping by because we've got famine. We got all kinds of issues with Native Americans attacking us because we've killed off most of them with their disease, with our diseases. So um, they're not happy with us. So we're just struggling to survive. And you want to tax us? The colonists weren't really feeling this, and particularly because, particularly because they're like, why make England wealthier when when we're over here struggling and just supporting them with providing stuff for them? So. King George him of this idea of of creating these this list of proclamations, and there were two main primary proclamations. One was the Sugar Act of 1764 and the Stamp Act of 1765. Both of these acts were based; they were going to tax sugar, and they, they were that was being imported in tamp and and also stamps. And so, 
colonists were upset, and so they repeal it in 1766. So the tensions are starting to escalate in the colonies. Um, so the colonists respond to these acts by a series of their own acts. The Townshend Act of 1767, well, they call them the Act, Townshend Acts. And under the Townshend Acts, they included the Tea Party or the Tea Act of 1773, which led to the Boston Tea Party, where, again, they broke and they basically commandeered a British ship through all the tea in the, in the, in the Boston Harbor or Boston Bay. Uh, and this, again, led to England drafting what was called the Intolerable Acts of 1774. And then the colonists get together and have what's called the First Continental Congress. Now, I do want to digress for one moment because there is one point here that I think I failed to, admit, to point out. In fact, it jumped ahead. If I can get rid of this, um, it's not going to let me for some reason. Anyhow, just behind here, behind this, this uh, depiction here, there's a, the, there was what was called the Intercolonial Stamp Act Congress. And this happened in 1765. And they, at this Congress, this convention, a uh, convening of the elites in the colonies, they draft what was called the Declaration of Rights and Grievances. And the Declaration of Rights and Grievances was basically the precursor to the Declaration of Independence. They're basically telling King, King George, we don't appreciate you trying to tax us without representation and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So they had the First Continental Congress. And then following that, they had the Second Continental Congress, where they basically draft out from that Declaration of Rights and Grievances what became the Declaration of Independence. Now, remember, <laughs> imagine King George gets this in the mail, right? Now, to him, it's a declaration of war. Like, who the heck do these colonists think they are? I'm the king. Like, you don't challenge the king. You do what the hell I tell you to do, right? So you can imagine King George is really, really upset about this. And uh, so... This, of course, leads to the Revolutionary War, and, you know, of course, we win, they lose, yay us, poor Brits, uh, which ends in July 4, 1776. And that's when we become our, our, our own separate entity, our own separate nation. Um, and at the beginning of this, of course, you need to have an infrastructure, even when, you know, we're free, and now, you know, freedom looks really good when you have structure. Freedom doesn't look so good when you don't have structure. So at the very, very beginning, um, we, they drafted what was called the Articles of Confederation, and this was like a precursor to the Constitution. And in this, basically, they've outlined having a weak central government. And the reason they wanted a, the, the colonists want, and the elites wanted a weak central government was because they didn't want to have it. They didn't want to go back to anything that remotely resembled the um, having that would lead to having a king. So they wanted to make sure that the states were stronger than the central government, and that that would be the way that they would structure the system uh, at the beginning of our country, founding of our country. Now, uh, there were problems with this. And here's the, here's the interesting thing about the people who've been oppressed. Once the, once the elites who had been oppressed by England had, were on their own and autonomous, and now they're the elites of, the, of these 13 states, they become the oppressors to the, to the farmers and the everyday workers. And so this resulted in what was called Shays Rebellion. And Daniel Shays, who was a farmer, along with a group of other farmers, decide to rebel and they attack the courthouse and many of the farmers are killed. And what this resulted in was the recognition that a weak central government was not going to hold this, these 13 states together. And that if this union of states, if these United States were going to hold themselves together, it could only do so by virtue of having a strong central government. And this is the, how the decision to, to draft a new constitution uh, came to fruition. Uh, let me, sorry, I'm going to the wrong direction here. Let me skip ahead here. So if you look at this chart here, you can see on the left the Articles of Confederation that was the original inception of our country, at the original inception of our country, and then the middle uh, column shows you the problems that were created because of it. And then to the right, what it shows you is the, new, the potential or the recommended or drafted new federal constitution that they were proposing, that many were proposing. Now, you have to understand that every not everyone wanted to see a new constitution. There are many of the elites who wanted to stick to the Articles of Confederation. They liked the structure. They liked that it was more closely... It's similar to the English system. Uh, 
minus the king, but it, but it gave them a more of a sense of continuity and security. But the new constitution was what was uh, being put forth. Uh, and because they realized that the way they, the structure wasn't going to work for them that they had come from. Now, of course, as I said earlier, the many problems existed in this new in setting up this new format. One was the issue of foreign trade because they had to figure out how to build an economy. They needed partners to trade with. Uh, so that, of course, had to do with the economic realities of all that. So they call it economic radicalism by thinking about what kind of new economic structure they were going to create. Of course, the security issue, dealing with the Native Americans who were pissed off, obviously, because they had been oppressing them and killing them and you know, all the diseases that came over from England that wiped out thousands and thousands of Native Americans on, on the continent. And then again, as I said, the, the post-war depression, you know, the economics cost of war was, was very, very high. Then comes George Washington, of course, our first president, our, under the new, uh, under this new, uh, a format who was a you know supporter of the new constitution and there were a couple of different plans that they had in place uh trying to discuss which plan was going to work in terms of creating this new constitution there was a virginia plan which which was called the large states plan and the new jersey plan which was called the small states plan so the virginia plan was supposed to give more adherence to the larger states the larger wealthier states with more resources like virginia that's why it's named after virginia and the New Jersey plan was to help give balance to the smaller states, saying, hey, we're small, but we deserve equal power. And so uh, so this is the two plans that were in place that they were trying to offer up on for this new constitution. Well, they came up with a compromise, uh, which is what we live with today. If you look at our Congress, our Congress is based on both these plans. It took both of them. So you have the House of Representatives, which is based on the large states plan, because, for example, it's based on size and, and number of population of people. So like California in the House of Representatives has 50 some odd representatives and smaller states like you know, Montana may have two. And that's because of the population size. So it was to help accommodate the large states so that they had more say in the House of Representatives. However, the House of Representatives is not the most pow powerful house of, in our Congress, the Senate is. And the Senate is adopted under the small state plan. And this basically says that no matter how big or how small your state is, everybody gets two representatives per state. Now, this sir, this people, many people feel this, this is a fair way to do it. There are many today who have questions about this because, uh, for example, no matter, California could have a quarter of the population of the country, but still only has two representatives. So sometimes it gets more states smaller states a disequal amount of power over larger states in the most powerful house in congress which is the senate uh, so this, the copper great compromise is what led to what we have which is a bicameral by meaning two uh houses in our, our legislature in our congress in our u.s congress this just shows you uh, basically the layout of the two plans here's the virginia plan the new jersey plan and then here's the compromise that they came up with One of the big issues that they were dealing with was slavery, um, particularly in states in the South where, you know, they needed a commodity. They needed a commodity of people to work all the, the, the natural resources in the area. So you had, you know, sugar, cotton, uh, tobacco, for example. All that was in the South because the weather was better. So you know, they wiped out all the Native Americans. So this was the hits why the commodity, the economic commodity of slaves and slave trade became an issue. But the problem was the issue of how they were going to base them for taxation. And they decided to count the slaves as three-fifths of a person. So each slave was worth was a considered not one whole person in, in, for terms of, uh, of taxation. So they came up with what was called the three-fifths compromise. And uh, that's how they were able to get the, constitu the Constitution ratified. This, is give, this particular chart shows you where, const where slavery existed more, more heavily. You can see... Mostly in the southern states is where you see it all along the eastern seaboard here uh, is where you see most of the slave trade exists. A few places up in here, um, but most of it was in the south because that's where the that's where the weather and most of the crops were. So some of the basic principles of the new constitution, of course, was to have a popular sovereign, but not have a but not have a person who could be the king, but to have a leader uh, within the un, in within the framework of it. But they did this by also having checks and balances and separating the powers between the executive branch, the legislative branch, which is our Congress, 
and then having the judicial branch, which is the Supreme Court and federal courts. So they tried to make sure there were checks and balances in place to make sure that not one entity of the three major areas could have more power than the other. Now, I will tell you, in our based on our world today, that there are points in times when sometimes the executive, meaning the president, is more powerful. There are times when the Supreme Court, the judicial, is more powerful, slightly more powerful. And there are times when the Congress is more powerful. It sort of varies depending on the situation at hand. So it's not always as simple as it may seem. In fact, I would argue one of the biggest problems we have with separation of powers is the fact that they should never have given the, this is my opinion, by the way, they should never have given the president the right to select the uh, Supreme Court justices or federal court judges because they could stack the deck and based on their own personal interests to protect them from any particular I issues that they may be failing at. So you never want to have it where the sovereign can protect themselves, no matter who it is, uh, by virtue of selecting people in the courts to be able to protect their interests. And that's the only part of the, of the three branches of government that is, that is somewhat controlled by the executive branch, unlike the Congress. So uh, that's, I mean, we live with that readily today. It's a real controversial issue today. So we'll talk more about that in class. This just shows you, and this is a really cool document because I really admire that the founding fathers really did put together a, a, a really interesting, really good overall sense of checks and balances. As again, I've said, I, my concern is that the president should not be able to uh, appoint anybody to the judiciary um, because that could protect them or insulate them from any, any risk of it being charged with anything, for example, if they were doing something illegal. Uh, so this is, again, a very masterful uh, piece of work that they put together. So the basis of our governing is called, it's called federalism, which we'll look at in Chapter 3 in more a little more detail. Uh, the enumerated powers are the powers that are accorded to our Congress by virtue of the Constitution, lays out their, their, their authority and the roles they play. Uh, we tried to build a Constitution that was flexible, meaning it's a living Constitution, meaning that if things changed over a period of time, things could be adjusted, things could be amended. Uh, that was the whole purpose of this, by making it so that by virtue of creating an amendment, you could, and having enough states and, and state legislators approve it, and you could basically modify the Constitution as the world changed. There was This wasn't an easy process to get this Constitution approved. Uh, there were people who, as I said earlier, who wanted support sticking with the, the uh, Articles of Confederation, and there were those who supported the Constitution. And there were many people looked at the advantages of, of, the, of the federal, con this new Constitution they were trying to push, and there were other people pushing back on the other end of it. Now, uh, the in order to get it ratified, meaning getting it, getting it approved, there were three primary individuals who wrote a very famous expose, a very dense <laughs> expose called called the Federalist Papers. And the Federalist Papers were written by James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay, that basically are, were defending the new Constitution. And basically, what they did was, if I go back to that chart where that I showed you earlier, that showed you. The Articles of Confederation in the middle showed you the problems with it, and then the, on the right it showed you the new constitution they were proposing. Well, they took the middle part, the problems with the Articles of Confederation, and that's what they emphasized in their justification for this new federal constitution. This shows you the process. Um, as you can see, it wasn't a simple process. As a matter of fact, um, it took, you know, literally from December 1787 till May of 1790, so you're talking all of uh, basically two and a half years from the first signature to the last signature on the on the Constitution, and you see some of the votes are pretty close, as you can see. So if you go down the list, you look a little bit like Massachusetts is very close. Uh, if you go down here to New Hampshire, was pretty close. Virginia was pretty close. New York was very close, uh, and then Rhode Island was very close. So there were really some, you know, close calls in getting this final constitution ratified. And again, most of, most of the colonies or states were looking at their own self-interest as to why they would either support it or not support it. So uh, the, the Bill of Rights, which are the first 10 amendments of the constitution, were originally proposed by Thomas Jefferson. He proposed 12 of them, and they ratified 10 of them. Uh, and that's, the, the, again, the essence of our Federalist uh, structure which we'll talk about in detail uh, in our previous, in our next uh, chapter. 
Uh, and the way we, the formal process for making our constitution, living constitution, really stems from what I call the three-fourths and the, the uh, two-thirds, three-fourths. So basically the way it works is you have to have a two-thirds vote in both state, in both the House of Representatives and in the Senate uh, of our U.S. Congress. And then after it's, it's approved in both houses of Congress, it goes to the state legislatures. And that means out of the 50 states, you have to have three-fourths of them, or approximately 38 states that have to approve it to amend the Constitution. So two-thirds of the, of the Congress on both houses, and then three-fourths of the states, which is 38 states of the 50 states, um, have to approve it in order to amend the Constitution. And this is showing you some of the issues that have been up for amendment uh, over the last several years. One was getting rid of the Electoral College, which is still a hot ticket item, mandatory retirement ages, and so forth, uh, retirement ages for Congress, uh, for the president, uh, <laughs> which has been a hot ticket item right now, uh, question of whether the Supreme Court justice should be elected. These are all things that are in the process that people are dis discussing. And they're very, very interesting uh, discussions that to be had to, for, for sure, uh, particularly regarding uh, the things like the mandatory age, like the issue that Joe Biden had dealt with uh, going into this presidential race. So this is uh, chapter two, and uh, that's it. I look forward to seeing you in chapter three. Have a great day, you guys.